Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Getting Hammered. I'm your host, Mary Catherine Ham. I'm here with my co-host, Vic Mattis of the Washington Free Beacon. We are your morning show for any hour. We got a bunch of news. We got some uh, Trump legal trouble news that actually have become slightly smaller, at least in dollar form this week. Uh, we have a scary bridge story out of Baltimore, which we will talk about, and an Israel update because we got to go after the UN and the Biden administration, as is our patriotic duty. But before we get to all that, Vic, how you doing? Hello, Mary Catherine. I'm doing fine. It's a, a busy, busy Holy Week as I, we get ready for our trip, as you know, heading down to uh, Charleston. But I did have something I wanted to share with you, and I've been thinking about this for quite some time. I have. This is big news for Getting Hammered listeners. I have a new favorite commercial, oh. a favorite TV news channel, so a Fox News slash CNN commercial, though really I think I've only seen it on Fox. Okay, so the old commercial. The old commercial was for insurance. It was a life insurance, and there's a couple talking, and the wife says, oh, did you hear about so-and-so who died? It's terrible, and you know they didn't have insurance. Yeah, it's, it's a real shame. He, like He had a heart attack or something. And then she says, but we have insurance, don't we? And then the husband gives him this sheepish look, like, ah, kind of effed up, you know, sorry. And she goes, John. And then they have the whole thing. And I just love the look on the husband's face. It's like, ah, you know, I really what? dropped the ball on this. Okay. Well, I got a new favorite commercial for you. This okay, one. And this, I've only seen that one. That, that one was, has been dethroned. Yes, it's been dethroned. Because I used to love looking at the guy's face with this sort of looks up with his eyes like, yep, that, just, that was me. Just to put it out there, I feel like we need an Oscars style special telecast at we, some point on I, just this. Right, exactly. I, 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 you know what? He'd get like a best supporting. So now, new favorite commercial. And this again, it, you know, it takes a lot of acting skills for this one. This is, I've only seen it once. This is a new Life Alert commercial. So we all know Life Alert, I fall and I can't get up. Oh, a well, classic of the genre. A yes. Classic. Well, this one, you know, there's a little bit of a twist. You never see the woman who has fallen and can't get up. Instead, okay. what you see, maybe you've seen this. Is that because we're soft as a society now? Maybe. No, well, I don't know. I'm not sure that's a possibility. We can't handle it. It's traumatic. It's the daughter. The daughter is trying to call the elderly mom, but mm -hmm. she's not answering the phone. Okay. So she's like three, four times. There's no answer. And then she said, and then the husband's there in the kitchen. She says, What's wrong? What are you all worked up about? Right. Right. And she says, Mom's not answering. You know, she almost she always answers the phone. There's something wrong. I think something happened. And then the husband says, I'm sure she's fine. Relax. Everything's fine. I'm sure she went out. No big deal. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. No, no, no. This is not like her at all. Relax, honey, he says, right? Uh -huh. Then the phone rings and it's the life alert people. And they say to her, your mother has been in, your mother had an accident. Mm -hmm. We're sending the ambulances on the way. Oh my gosh. And it's the look on the husband's face that's priceless. He's like, oh. <laughs> and I can't tell if it's like he's overcompensating. So now he has to look really concerned right, about right. his mother-in-law. Or was he like, ah, darn that life alert? You know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. If you ever see it, look at the guy's face. It's part guilt ridden. Uh -huh. And the other part is I'm not sure what's going on there. There's a story. So that's what I have for us. Today. That's your that's your new commercial. Okay. That's my I'm new gonna favorite to, commercial. I'm gonna have to find both of these so that I can yes, be properly yes. Mary Catherine, how are you? Oh, I'm all right. Just before we got on this, I was I was succeeding in a mission, Vic. Okay. I was like, succeeding in a mission yeah. to set a very minor doctor's appointment. Okay, that is a difficult mission. <laughs> it's insane. And I don't I don't want to be like a I feel like a hack comedian right now where I'm just like complaining about the insurance system and, and medical offices. But let me just let me just briefly <laughs> But do so. And then later on tell us about the DMV. The yeah, DMV. And the okay, airport yeah. food or the airline. Food. <laughs> right, right. But I do want to just briefly say. That in these modern times, all I needed to do was get a referral which existed already. It's not like I'm arguing for the referral. The referral exists from one office to another office, okay? Now, here's the, here's the trick, Vic. I'm like, this doesn't seem to be going well because the office that needs the referral requires you to fax it. And you're, they're not oh, getting fax. it. Fax, yes, so, they still do like faxes. Two or three faxes. Wow. By the way, in total, it was fourteen or fifteen phone calls oh, to get this goodness. done. So, 
faxing is happening. And I'm like, this is a bad sign. How about, how about if my doctor just gives me the referral through a service known as email and I a scan either bring it to you or email it to you. And they're like, no, cause it's got to come from the doctor. And it's going to get out of the, come out of the machine. Yeah. And, and the doctor's not, apparently the doctor can't do it it's him, himself or the doctor's office. Well, they're trying, but they're doing it the way that this doctor's office requires, which is fax. Okay. Then halfway through the day after like eight phone calls, someone tells me, well, why are they faxing? They should email. Oh no. Well, oh, your message on. service says fax about 79 times. Uh -huh. So I think that's why they were doing it. So then it's emailed twice. And by the way, at the end of the, at, at the end of all of this, uh, along the way, I'm like, could I just, here's, here's a thought. Could I show up to your office with the order yeah. and my insurance card, which when I hand it to you will ensure that you are paid. By the way, I'll ensure you're paid even if I don't have the insurance card. Right. But like, could I just come there and then we could do it? They're like, nope, we have to have all this information before we even schedule you an appointment. And I know that there are probably scuff laws that have created the situation where I have to be in the system before they can schedule yeah. the appointment. But my Lord. And then I finally was scheduled this morning. That's too much. And the phone call that you heard yes. was the follow-up to a phone call that told me after I was scheduled, ma'am, you're not in the system and you're not scheduled. And I was like, okay. ma'am, if I come to this office today yeah. and I am told to go home, I will lose my mind. <laughs> and well, then- it and it's, then they worked it, yeah. it out for me. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad they did. But By you the know, way, it's, yeah. it's perverse incentives that every time I get snippy, I get results. Yeah, okay? you don't want to get snippy. But... I don't. Only 14 calls later did I go like, I, I will lose right. my mind if this doesn't happen. When you're not snippy, they're like, ah, well, we could push her a little bit more. Yes. I think yes. that's Yes, and you like. should reward people for good behavior. Yeah. I didn't get too snippy. It wasn't that lady's fault. It was just a system failure. It was a system failure. It was, it, it, you know, it was when my father, you know, was a doctor until he retired in 2008. It was a different world. In fact, none of their right. And my mother worked in the office. She was the office manager. They didn't have anything computerized. Yeah. It was all still paper. And so they really left at the right time because now, you know, I mean, everything and, and, and everybody's part of a group, right? Every doctor is part of a group. Right, right, right. And, and he was a sole practitioner. You don't really see a lot of that anymore. Everybody's in a practice. Otherwise, you get pushed out, you know, and you're right. battling for patients. It's just the and my father-in-law started off the same way, but he ended up in a in a practice as a urologist. The other thing is Kate and I always commiserate. When we grew up, we never had any hospital or doctor issues because you I, I went downstairs to the basement for uh. treatment. <laughs> or if you needed to go to the hospital or to die, you just walked in. Yeah. You just well, well, just go in through the side entrance. And then, you know, you come out here and I'm like, you, you check in and you're waiting for hours. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't believe everybody has to do this, you know? So it, for me, it was a real wake up call about how terrible it is because I didn't like know that. Like, oh my goodness. It's unacceptable. By the, by the time this happened, I could have Pony Expressed or even in fact, just walked the order from one office yeah, to yeah, another. Yeah, in person. And I, not even driving. I could have just walked it, but here we are. I have succeeded in this, this minor miracle. Oh, and, you know, so, so much for parenting my children yesterday. Cause I needed to be on the phone 15 times, but yeah. speaking well, of system failures, can I tell a slightly better story? Not right. as hacky comedian story from last night. <laughs> we are at the lake cause it's spring break. They're lovely. So we're kicking off spring yes. down here and, and we went to dinner. We went to dinner last night and we went to dinner, Vic, at 4 p.m. <laughs> now that's like three, at least more than that's more than three hours before sunset. No, so we went we went to dinner at 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. because we have two babies. Yes, and the babies go this to sleep really early. Yes, but we like to do things with the babies, sure. and we want the babies to be inside restaurants so that they learn a little bit about how that. Yes, works. do you go to? Can I ask you this? <laughs> you don't have to answer. Do you bring all the devices with you? to the no, restaurant no this is the thing we we are a family that does not do yeah. devices at the table we we're the same and so we have to teach the children how to exist without devices at the table yeah. and look at look at each other and you have to start interact early. so we take the we take the babies at four o'clock now 
we take the boat because we're bougie. We have a little, little. Oh, lovely. We're going on a boat. Uh huh. It's cold out, but we don't care. It's spring. We're living it up, Vic. And everybody gets their life jackets on. It's a whole thing. We get yeah, them there. You, that's required. Kids got to have whole, life like, jackets. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. it's a process. Yes. We get over there for our 415 early bird dinner. We sit down. So you, you pull up on a, on, a, on the dock? Yes. Oh, like, like a little slip? And then, yes. Oh, very nice. We sit down to have our dinner. We order. Uh-huh. Everything's going nicely. Steve and I are like, let's have a margarita. Yeah, have a margarita. And everyone's behaving well. The babies are learning to use straws. It's good. It's good times. The straws. Yes. <laughs> Yes. They Was have, that my breathing? What's happening here? They have you know? lids. Yeah. They have lids on their drinks. You know, yeah. they took care of it for us. And then I get a text from our neighbor that says, "Is it okay for Scout to be out?" Oh. And it said, "Hmm. Nope. That's not ideal." Now Scout doesn't like to be left behind. He's a very well-behaved dog, but yeah. he wants to be with the family. Right. And in a new experiment, he was. That will will now not be a thing we do anymore. <laughs> he was he was left on the screened in porch instead of in the house. We thought sure. it's a nice happy medium. Yeah, no, it's a little bit more airy. Yeah, no, that didn't work because. And then we thought, oh my gosh, what did what did he do to get out? Yeah, did he did he bust through mm-hmm. the screen? <laughs> right up. You don't have one of those little. We have a door. Doors. We have a dog guard on the lower do- part. Okay. But I was like, you know, he can fly. That that dog could go straight through the upper part. Right. So we're we have dreams of like going back to find this nonsense. But Steve jumps up, goes back to get the dog. <sighs> he gets on the boat, goes back, retrieves, <laughs> retrieves the dog. He's on the dock, but he doesn't go inspect the house yet. We later found out that, in fact, the dog is just very smart, and he learned to nudge open the door oh. and escape that way. So well, we have no uh, damage. Yeah. And God like bless velo- him, he He's just, like the velociraptor in Jurassic Park. He, should, he did just stay, like, standing on solvers. the dock and didn't. That's, that's my well, He was fear, standing guard. He was waiting for you to come back. Yeah, he was, waiting, he was waiting to come back, for us to come back. So then... Uh, Steve does not feel he can trust the dog, so he takes the dog back to the restaurant. No. He's tied up in the boat like the little criminal that he is. So that Steve can go back and finish his margarita and then we can get on with our day. But just let that be a lesson to everyone. Even if you get your four children to a calm, nice 4.15 p.m. dinner, your fifth child, Scout, will decide things out. to sabotage you with his misbehavior. But everything worked out fine. I went down to babysit the, the Scoflaw dog in the He gets lonely. But, yeah. Uh, is he much of a barker? No, not really. Good. And thank goodness that this is a lovely thing, too, is that we know, we know our neighbors and yeah. we, everybody has our contact info and they know exactly who he is. So we were alerted quickly. And yeah, I don't and, and glad like, that he didn't end up on like running around in the front. Well, I don't think he'd run off or, or anything. Yeah. But he would. The thing that worries me sometimes is that if if he thought we were on the water and he tried to swim to find us, oh, that yeah. would be concerning. Mm-hmm. I think he's probably smart enough not to yeah. get himself into trouble yeah. that way. But strikes me to open as a, the dang door. Now we know. No, it strikes me as a smart dog, and he was just waiting for you to come back. Uh, anyway, I with a are. doggy bag. <laughs> All right, we got a lot to talk about. And yeah. I'm using up all our time with Sorry, I know. You're complaining. <laughs> a, we, we got us. a hard out, too. We got I know. Go. Okay. All right, all right. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Should we, let me just mention that this, this key bridge in oh Baltimore, which is a more yeah. than a mile long bridge on the east side of Baltimore, was hit by a container ship that seemed to lose power a couple of times before it looks like it it hit the the support for this bridge and just as an illustration not to be flippant about it at all just so that you can imagine it if you haven't seen video yet it hits the support structure and the whole bridge goes down like a lego contraption instantaneously i mean it is so so frightening now a container ship is obviously gigantic and this one appears to have lost control the Early press conference info suggests that there's no ill intent or terrorism involved. Likely not any any 
anything other than a terrible accident at this point yeah. that we know about. And some encouraging news from this is that two people were rescued. Yeah. Which yeah. I amazing did not feel secure about at all. 20 people are missing, which is awful. This happened at 1.30 in the morning, which is a bit of a blessing in that it was not rush hour on this bridge right. when this happened. But the Port of Baltimore, which is a large part of eastern east coast infrastructure is likely to be impeded indefinitely right. for for some period of time which is going to cause many cascading issues yeah it's a it's a very deep harbor like 50 feet down i think jennifer knows more about this than than we do but that's why it's a, a very useful harbor for shipping and but with the bridge collapsed you can't have these ships crossing over now, I imagine, because there's so much debris. I think that the key concern is that with the design of the bridge, from what I understand, that there were no there was no redundancy put in right. place. But it's an, oh it's over 50 years old, this bridge. You know, okay. I mean and 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 in fact, I think some of the missing or some of the people who were on the bridge besides drive, there was a construction crew. Yes, I believe that's that was what I heard. there. You know, checking and 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 checking to reinforce concrete and things like that, because it's a very Relatively speaking, it's an old bridge. Um, and it's it's very high, and so yeah, it's it's awful. And when you watch that video, how fast it all comes tumbling down is is, is really quite shocking. So, I have a thoughts and prayers. Yes, uh, definitely prayers, especially for the uh, responders and yes, divers yeah. who, to my mind, somewhat miraculously, have already rescued two people. So right. that's very dangerous work that they're going right. to be doing in very cold water. So yeah, the the crucial um, time is now because the storm's coming up. But. Yeah. Um. So I, by the way, I have a very specific bridge fear, and uh, this is not. Oh, that's not going to help. I exactly. know somebody, I knew somebody else when I was in high school, you know, had to like close his eyes when you go over a bridge. I'm like, this is not good for that. But yeah, it's, it's not great. Honestly, um, but I mean, it is, it is, it, it was weirdly this, this blessing that it happened at 1.30 a.m., not for the families or the people who are missing, obviously, but right. that this wasn't during a uh, rush hour or any other time. Because if this isn't a matter of, oh, I can't see it's dark, obviously, but rather we lost control because of some yeah. electrical ish, issue on board. That could have happened any time. Yep. Yep. Scary. Yeah. Um, so, yes, be best to the rescue crews, and we yeah. hope we hear some more encouraging news out of that situation. It will then inevitably be used as a political cudgel in the near future, but until forth. then, we're still in breaking say, news portion uh, uh, of the story. So far, I've seen Governor Westmore speak. You know, I mean, this would have been Larry Hogan's thing as well, but Westmore seemed to be handling it well at the moment in contrast to, I remember, Hurricane Katrina. And do you remember New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin? Yes. And he just had a, he had a massive meltdown on air. And, it, you know, it's not helpful. And yeah. I know it's terrible, but he starts screaming. I'm like, you're the mayor. You know, yeah. people are turning to you for guidance. It's just, okay. <sighs> well, there you go. All right. Let's do a little Trump yeah. legal woes, which as I noted, have become slightly smaller this week. This right. is in the public. Less woeful. This, yeah. This is in the the civil business fraud judgment against yeah. Trump, which is that's Judge Ingeron. If you you guys have been following this with us, yeah. a New York appeals court on Monday paused for 10 days a massive civil business fraud judgment against Donald Trump and sharply reduced to 175 million the bond amount he will have to pay to obtain a longer stay of that award. Now, he had been asked to pay $454 million, as you guys remember. Mm -hmm. The ruling came the same day the New York Attorney General Letitia James could start seizing the former president's real estate assets and bank accounts to satisfy that old giant $454 million bond. James is prevented from doing so for now due to the order from the five-judge panel in Manhattan Supreme Court's appellate division, which did not give a reason for cutting the bond threshold by about 60%. I bet the reason is that, like, the other one was insane. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting. So, you know, and he has 10 days, mm -hmm. right, to, to pay off, to pay this appeal, appeal bond. He's going to do it in cash because that he has. It is funny that his critics are still, they're, they're up in arms over this. And I know some of the late night hosts last night, including Colbert, they were so disappointed because they said today was supposed to be an amazing day. You know, this great day where, you know, Letitia James and the people of New York seize his property to save democracy. 
it's and they, such a, it's such a bad impulse that that such, feels good to you. Yeah, no, it really is. And let alone that the process is not going to be where you know. I mean, just the process of opposing Leans is it, it, it takes longer than you know rushing in and kicking yeah. them out and throwing your stuff on the street. You know, which is what they wanted. And what I was going to say, Michael Steele, the former RNC chair, now right. you know regular on RNC on MSNBC, he had tweeted out. You know, his disappointment in the lowering of the bond to 175 and basically was like, well, this goes to show how our legal system is rigged to help these billionaires. And I'm like, really? That was the problem? It wasn't the $454 million unprecedented for a, a you know, a charge in which there was it was a victimless, a victimless crime of over-evaluating I mean, your property. That is uh, worth emphasizing, as we do every time we talk about this story, is that the, the banks to whom he allegedly inflated his property values do not dispute them, and they don't yeah. allege that they were hurt no. because he paid them back. No. Like, it's, a, it's a money grab for the state of New York. It's it's just the whole thing is yeah. wild. Yeah. And by the way, this is just the amount he has to pay to to appeal, correct? That's correct. Right. Yeah. So so but this is not even the final judgment. This doesn't I, I don't think shields him from a final judgment of more money. But it, no, and this only gives him the opportunity to appeal and they're still this mad about it. That's right. And the attorney the New York Attorney General Letitia James who made it her, you know, campaign promise to go after him on something. She said that, you know, keep in mind, you know, this doesn't change anything. And he is still accruing something like a hundred, a hundred twelve thousand dollars a day in interest. Good. Keep bragging about that. Cause yeah. that sure makes you look like a responsible I, legal officer of the state. Right. It's like financially, this is a disaster it would be a disaster for Trump to have like assets seized and accounts frozen or declare bankruptcy. But politically, you know, it only makes them more powerful. Golly. This is like Frank Luntz said this, right? Frank Luntz is like, yeah. you are to blame if you do this. If you go after his properties, don't come ask. Don't ask me about how did Trump win, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, by the way, you mentioned uh, Michael Steele, former head of the RNC, who has a commentator position at NBC. I'm going off script. Did you? Oh, I know where you're going. Did you're you going see the NBC script, meltdown? And I know where you're going. You saw the NBC meltdown over former I RNC did. head Ronna McDaniel did. being hired as a paid commentator at NBC. They're really mad. In fact, we'll play a clip of Chuck Todd going off on the air about it. Look, let me deal with the elephant in the room. Yeah. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation because I don't know what to believe. She is now a paid contributor by NBC News. So I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. Mm. Um, she wants us to believe that she was speaking for the RNC when the RNC was paying for it. So she has, she has credibility issues that she still has to deal with. Yeah. Is she speaking for herself or is she speaking on behalf of who's paying her? What, once at the RNC, she did say that, hey, I'm speaking for the party. I get that. That's part of the job. So what about here? I, I will say this. I think your interview uh, did a good job of exposing, I think, many of the contradictions and look, there's a reason why there's a lot of journalists at NBC News uncomfortable with this, because many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting, mm. have been met with character assassination. So it is, it, you know, that's where you begin here. And so um, when NBC made the decision to give her NBC News' credibility, you got to ask yourself, what does she bring NBC News? And when we make deals like this, and I've been at this company a long time, you're doing it for access, access to audience. Sometimes it's access to an individual. Mm -hmm. um, and we can have a de journalistic ethics debate about that. And I, 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 I'm willing to have that debate. And if you told me we were hiring her as a technical advisor to the Republican convention, I think that would be certainly um, defensible. If you told me we're, we're talking to her, but let's, let's see how she does in some interviews and maybe vet her with actual journalists inside the network. See, see if it's a two-way, mm. what she can bring the network. So I do think, unfortunately, this interview is always going to be looked through the prism of right. who is she speaking for, right. Right? right? I think you did everything you could do. You got put into an impossible situation yeah. booking this interview, and then all of a sudden the rugs pull out from under you. You find out she's being paid to show up. That's it's unfortunate 
for this program, but I am glad you did the best that you could, and that's why the three of us are on here to, to try to um, bolster that editorial independence. Now... And also Morning Joe, by the way. Yeah. Also, they were, they, they had to go, they was like, NBC, it's not, we, they don't speak for us. We urge them to reconsider. Yeah. I don't, look, I shouldn't be confused about this, but yeah. let me just say, a former head of the RNC or the DNC being hired as a commentator mm -hmm. after their stint as the head of a committee is a real normie hire. That is not a norm-busting hire. Whether they're always good hires is a whole other discussion, but it's not outside of the mainstream to yeah. put this person on air. And yeah. Todd seems to be confused about, like, will she be speaking on behalf of the RNC or will she be speaking on behalf of or trying to keep her NBC contract? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, we're not... You guys weren't confused about this when you hired Michael Steele. Or how about Jen or, Psaki? Well, and that's Sorry. the more recent one, right? Yes. It's like, like Michael Steele was an actual head of the RNC. Yeah. And you hired that's him. That's right. No biggie, partly because he's like endorsed Joe Biden, right? Right. Oh, that may. Yeah, that, that's the good kind of Republican. That's the difference, right? It's mm -hmm. an ideological difference. It's not actually this ethical difference, I think, that they are, right. they are pointing to. The more recent one is Jen Psaki went almost directly from spokesperson for the Biden administration oh, yeah. to primetime show, right? Yeah, and got her own. Forget about being a contributor. Yeah. She has her own show. So how is that ethically yeah. different? Question mark? Well, okay. So as Mika Brzezinski clarified, she used all my favorite phrases. She actually said, to be clear. To be now, clear. That, that, that's, not, that's right up there with to be sure. Like, yeah. To be clear. We think that there should be some balance of okay. uh, you know, having a Republican, con but, but that's different than having a Trump supporter. Uh, so we don't want the Trump supporter so who is an election anyone... denier. An election denier. This is actually and... a problem I have with, with media. It's like, look, I'm, I'm happy to be a center-right commentator. I've enjoyed yeah. doing it for many places, including NBC, because I think that people on the right deserve representation in these places. Right. It is frustrating that there's almost no one who represents people who actually voted for Trump. And yeah, I, no, they, I attempt to be that voice sometimes just because there is an absence of it, right? Yeah. And I will make arguments on behalf of people who might be more passionate on that right. than I am. Mm -hmm. But they, they are literally just saying they don't want anyone to represent the viewpoints of half the electorate. Right. I was going to say of someone who garnered more than 70 million votes. So that's a problem, I think. And, and they went, you know, so I mean, and this became a, the tense standoff that Rana Romney McDaniel had with Kristen Welker on Meet the Press. Right. And as our Andrew Stiles noted before that segment, Kristen Welker issued like a trigger warning. We're going to have oh, somebody who on. supports Trump on prepare yourself this, or don't watch, like, you know, I, I hate this messaging also that a former head of the RNC's words are like yeah. dangerous to your audience. Oh, sure. It's insulting to your audience. Like there are certain people. Maybe <laughs> it really shouldn't. depends on the audience. Look, well, and there are certain people maybe you shouldn't platform, but I wouldn't set yeah. the, the barriers so yeah. Yeah. narrow mm -hmm. that you're cutting out the head of the RNC or the head of right. the DNC. Right. Like it's right. just. That's not productive. I would also say one of the arguments they make against her is like that she's an election denier, and that's why right. it's right. different. Guy Benson notes, the media NBC meltdown over Rana isn't about blue versus red or even Trump necessarily. It's about the principle of a respectable network not platforming someone who's engaged in election denial, which is uniquely dangerous and would elicit this sort of reaction regardless of party. He attaches two screenshots. One of Terry McAuliffe refusing to say that George W. Bush was the legitimate elected president and right. defending his claims that the 2000-2004 elections were stolen. And then another screenshot. Former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe becomes CNN commentator. That's perfect. <laughs> what, you know, what, what I'll tell you what Guy gets wrong is that what Guy gets wrong is that the, these rules are beginning right now. Oh, okay. 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 So gotcha. I don't want to hear about the Diebold machines from 2004 right, right, being right. rigged to vote for George W. OK, I'm talking or 2016 for that matter with Hillary. No, beginning now, you can't deny it. 
from this moment on. New era, new era. Depends. It kind of depends. It's also worth noting MSNBC, you know, had as has a contributor, Al Sharpton. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. I got two it's, words it for you. Crown matter. Heights. If you don't know what that is, look it up. But you know, really, that apparently is okay. It's all fine. Yeah. All right. Speaking of fine, <laughs> let's talk about the UN and the oh. Biden administration yeah. um, semi teaming up against our our friends in Israel. This is from a CNN lead, and then we'll get more into the details. But tensions between the United States and Israel were exposed on Monday when Washington stood aside and allowed the U.N. Security Council to pass a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The U.S. decision to abstain on the vote prompted Israel's Prime Minister, Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to cancel a scheduled trip to the U.S. by two of his top advisors, two of Israeli officials said. The U.S. had previously vetoed similar resolutions calling for a ceasefire. Its position evolved last week when on Friday it put forward a ceasefire resolution tied to the release of hostages. That resolution fell when it was vetoed by Russia Russia and China. The U.S. abstention on Monday's vote allowed the latest resolution to pass when the other 14 members of the 15 Strong Council voted yes. So CNN is actually framing this pretty accurately Sure. instead of just saying like, oh, abstention means nothing. Abstention means something. Yes, it does. Because the U.S. has the power to veto. And instead of vetoing, as China and Russia are happy to do, it abstains so that China and Russia can get their way in this. They're just just getting out of their way in order to allow this to happen. Well, you might as well just be on board and just have voted for it. Because I know John Kirby was insisting, who is, you know, uh, uh, the White House spokesman, right. saying that, well, you know, these are non-binding. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, it, it doesn't force them to do anything. Great. Well, what's the point then? Let's, by the way, let's play a clip of Kirby, who, he's the best in the administration at talking about this, and yeah. I appreciate him. Amazingly. But he's, they're trying to have it both ways. Both like. ways. Uh, today, as you all know, we abstained on a UN Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza till the end of Ramadan. And the release of all the hostages. Our vote does not, I repeat, does not represent a shift in our policy. We've been very clear, we've been very consistent in our support for a ceasefire as part of a hostage deal. That's how the hostage deal is structured, and the resolution acknowledges the ongoing talks. We wanted to get to a place where we could support this resolution, but Because the final text does not have key language that we think is essential, such as condemning Hamas, we couldn't support it. Though, because it does fairly reflect our view that a ceasefire and the release of hostages come together, we abstained. Uh, Defense Minister Gallant uh, is here today meeting with uh, Mr. Sullivan. In fact, as we speak, uh, he'll have other meetings uh, while he's in town uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, certainly with uh, Secretary of Defense Austin uh, tomorrow. Um, and uh, and so we certainly look forward to having those discussions with him um, and making it clear to the defense minister that the United States continues to stand with Israel as they fight Hamas uh, and will continue to work with might and main to get those hostages back with their families where they belong. Seth Mandel over at Commentary notes that, of course, this is just giving in to everything. Yeah. Because this is a ceasefire for the month of Ramadan. It is not contingent on any hostages being released. And as a result, when you give this kind of, which anybody can understand if they understand any sort of incentives ever Mm -hmm. and how humans work, if the international community says, yeah, 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 no, we can do a ceasefire without any hostages being released, guess what happens to Hamas and its incentives to negotiate its surrender or the release of hostages? Right. It doesn't have any incentive to do those things because if the U.S. is saying, oh, we're going to abstain from this vote, which Mm -hmm. isn't binding, but, you know, like all this rhetoric matters in this fight, as does the U.S. and administrative administration officials like Kamala Harris saying you can't touch Rafa, which is essentially what she said the other day. Right. Because this is where they are now, right? Hamas, this is the last stronghold. So you wouldn't want to go after them there. Again, and we say this all the time that, you know, there's a way out of this. This can all end today if Hamas just surrendered and surrendered the hostages. But somehow they're not to blame. But Strangely, ceasefire now is yeah. never asking for the thing that would actually create a ceasefire. Yes. Right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly right. What they want is a ceasefire that keeps Hamas in power. 
And then we'll deal with the hostages. Eh, we'll get to it at some point. CNN had on one of their contributors, Evelyn Farkas, who is she's a former deputy secretary of state under Obama, right? And she was asked about this situation. And she says, you know, it's about time the United States took on Israel in public to call them out on this, right? Because she said, you know, it would be, you know, what we want is a ceasefire now and a two-state solution. Because that, you know, Israelis all want that. It's just Bibi. Bibi is the only person yeah. in all of Israel who is, again, he's the, he's the obstacle to two-state solution. As you mentioned, Mary Catherine, all Israelis, you know, want that, yes. right? Yeah. No, he, he, is, he is definitely on the same page with Israelis. There are plenty of Israelis who have issues with him and did, you know, long before this started. Yeah. But again, he formed a unity government to help shield him, himself and the government from the idea that it was some sort of partisan endeavor, right? Right. And again, Biden going after him, if he wants to right. not strengthen Netanyahu, it's like it's a terrible strategic decision because yeah. Israelis are like, hey, don't tell us what to do. And they're going to rally to some extent right. behind right. the guy that you're telling needs yeah. to give up his spot. Kamala, by the way, we should play that clip. Oh, yeah. Just so you know that she is well informed. We have been clear in multiple conversations and in every way that any major military operation in Rafah would be a huge mistake. Let me tell you something. I have studied the maps. There's nowhere for those folks to go. And we're looking at about a million and a half people in Rafah who are there because they were told to go there, most of them. And so we've been very clear that um, it would be a mistake to move into Rafa with any type of military operation. A mistake, but would there be consequences if he does move forward? Well, we're going to take it one step at a time, but we've been very clear in terms of our perspective on whether or not that should happen. Are you ruling out that there would be consequences from the United States? I am ruling out nothing. All right, Vic, there you have it. She has studied the maps. Yeah, I mean, I, I continue to be reassured that, you know, God forbid something happened to our president. This country's in good hands. You yeah. Know, she's... It's it's it. She's looked at the map. You got nothing to worry about. I do want to say, by the way, so Trump had sent uh, issued his own message to Bibi saying that he needs to finish the job because the world yes. is turning against Israel. So two things: one, Israel's used to having the world against them. Okay, so they're not they're not worried like oh everyone hates us. You know, okay. That's the first thing. The second thing is this woman I mentioned earlier from CNN, Evelyn Farkas, she was asked about the Trump line about finish the job. Oh, does that mean BB's losing friends, even Trump? And Farkas says, actually, she was concerned that Trump said finish the job because that oh. would suggest that, you know, defeating Hamas. And, you know, she said, that's impossible. You'll never be able to get all of them. So never, that's never where we are, which do I, I feel like BB is like, oh yeah, well, we're going to try, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Israel has no choice. Israel has no choice yeah. but to At actually defeat this enemy, right? Yeah. Because if you don't, they flood back up into the north. They end up on your border again, and yes. they do what they have said they want to do. Right. It's which in the is, charter. we would like to murder as many Israelis as possible. Yes. Particularly Jews, but all of them are game. All civilians, fair game. Civilians. And we would do it over and over and over again. Until Israel is gone, because they don't want a two-state solution. What right. they want is a one-state solution, and that state should be Hamas-run, or at the very right. least, Iranian proxy-run. Um, that's right. I mean, that's hence the end the occupation before they even went into Gaza. Right. You know, the other thing is you're mentioning this the other day in the news. Israel reported that they had just interdicted, you know, a major weapons shipment attempting to get from Iran to the to the west bank and it was a lot and this is what we're talking about i mean these are I mean, this we know what the end we know what the yeah. end game is as you mentioned the the the, the plan is not for a, a peaceful coexistence if right. you're under you know hamas or an iranian proxy it just isn't well and you know let us let us remember that just like two weeks ago i believe while i was in israel it was announced that the biden administration was once again like releasing tens of billions of dollars to iran Okay, right. so I want to read the the Trump quote yeah. because it's important to note that this man never loses an opportunity to lose an opportunity. Oh boy! Right? Like, uh -huh. I think a lot of people look at Trump versus Biden on an issue like Israel. If they care about this issue, if yeah. they care about confronting 
a terrorist threat right. with a Western response, right? Mm -hmm. They look at the two of these guys and they go, well, Trump, like, I don't know, he did the Abraham Accords, like, he moved the embassy. He got Soleimani, took him out. He makes no apologies. He moved the embassy. World War III did not break out at that point. This guy seems to understand incentive structure perhaps a little bit better than the establishment Middle East policy people, right? right. I think that's a fair take on Trump, right? That, that he might even, he would do the things like bullying Qatar a little bit more maybe. Right. He would do the things like not giving Iran billions of dollars, which would, that would lead to maybe a safer situation. Right. But then he's asked about it, and this is what he says. If you were president again, how would you counter the wave of anti-Semitism in the wake of the war's outbreak? Okay, so he's asked about anti-Semitism. Just sure. to start. Well, that's because you fought back. And I think Israel made a very big mistake. I wanted to call Israel and say, don't do it. These photos and shots, I mean, moving shots of bombs being dropped into buildings in Gaza. And I said, oh, that's a terrible portrait. It's a very bad picture for the world. The world is seeing this every night. I would watch buildings pour down on people. I would say it was given by the it would say it was given by the defense ministry and said, whoever's providing that, that's a bad image. He goes on to say, he's, the, the interviewer says, but terrorists are hiding in those buildings. Then he says, go and do what you have to do, but you don't do that. And I think that's one of the reasons that there has been a lot of kickback. If people didn't see that every single night, I've watched every single one of those. And I think Israel wanted to show that it's tough, but sometimes you shouldn't be doing that. Okay. First of all, he's asked about anti-Semitism and doesn't address it at all, right. except to say that, that, that the Jews fought back and that's the reason for the anti-Semitism. Now, Trump has a way of just saying things that might be actually true, but he's not necessarily mm -hmm. endorsing them or you can't tell if he's endorsing right. them. You don't know. And then he takes a turn and seems to say, do what you got to do, but also don't publicize it at yes. all or have to have, right. try to have. It's, it's the image. He's concerned about the image. Right. Yeah. This is a criticism of like IDF optics. comms. Yeah. I yeah. Don't... yeah. No, he's big on optics. <laughs> Which, yes, that is his area of expertise. But I would note that the, that the IDF is also working within a Middle East context. Yeah. And that's a place where toughness does matter. Yeah. Strength. We're seeing these things does Always matter. Always recognize strength. Uh -huh. Oh, you mentioned George W. Bush had a comment. Oh, this. yes. We just wanted to, I just wanted to note the prescience of one GWB right. speaking shortly after the October 7th attacks and give credit where it's due because this is his, his take on this and, and where we might be in the very near future. Here's GWB from October. It's a democracy. And in a democracy, the people's voices matter. And there's going to be a weariness. You watch. The world's going to be, okay, let's negotiate. You know, Israel's got to negotiate. They're not going to negotiate. These people have played, played their cards. Mm. They want to kill as many Israelis as they can. And negotiating with killers is not a, an option for the elected government of Israel. And so we're just going to have to remain steadfast. But it's not going to take long for people. That's gone on too long. Surely there's a way to settle this through negotiations. Both sides are guilty. My view is one side is guilty, and it's not Israel. Correct on that, sir. I also, oh, we got to do His a, approval rating, by the way, is like through the roof now. Isn't that oh, funny? <laughs> you got to do, I got to do a you love to hear it also, even though it's not surprising at this point from Senator John Fetterman, the conscience, oh, yeah. the conscience of the Democratic Party. <laughs> Two tweets. It's appalling the U.S. allowed passage of a resolution that fails to condemn Hamas. The U.N. has always been unwilling to condemn this group of terrorists, cowards, and rapists. We must stand with Israel and stop pandering to the political fringe or Hamas apologists. He also addresses Kamala specifically. Screenshot of the headline that says, Harris says U.S. has not ruled out consequences if Israel invades Rafah. Hard disagree. Israel has the right to prosecute Hamas to surrender or to be eliminated. Hamas owns every innocent death for their cowardice, hiding behind Palestinian lies. The man's on fire. The man's on fire. He is he's on fire and he's putting his fellow Senator Casey from Pennsylvania in a in a bad position because he's being out Israeled by by John Fetterman. And I, I get it that Fetterman, he just won election. So, you know, he, he's going to he's just going to speak his mind and he doesn't care. You should see the comments yeah. that go after Fetterman. I mean, it's brutal. I mean, there are oh, a lot yeah. of people who are obviously saying thank you. Thank you for being a, a, a bold and courageous voice in this, especially among Democrats. But man, the vitriol 
people who are, you know, very much disappointed. But again, fascinating. Just yeah. a fascinating turn. I mean, again, how do, I mean, how would we have known that he would be so staunchly pro-Israel? Because I mean, it's not like that would come up in a in the debate. Everybody just wanted to know if he could function well, at the time. And the thing is, he was he really was like he's a sort of looked like a blue collar guy, but was yeah. pitched as a more sort of like intellectual progressive. That was mm -hmm. yeah, that yeah, was yeah, sort sure. of the pitch that right. he was going to be more in line with that part of the party, and certainly on this issue and on some actually freedom related and spending related issues. He's very much not. And he yeah. speaks as though, weirdly for a politician, he actually believes these things. Right. It's it's, a, it's again, nice. it's, it's, nice. it's like the movie regarding Henry. You know, all of a sudden he's just free it to just really share is. his opinions or, or Dave. Okay. All right. Two more things. Okay. Here we give, go. I want to give a brief update on Kate Middleton. Oh, right. I, you know, we're behind the news here, yeah. but we gave, we gave a brief update. On her and the the Princess of Wales sat down straight to camera and told folks that she indeed had this abdominal surgery and that they found something cancerous. Yeah. And so they had engaged in um, sort of prophylactic ish uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, chemotherapy that she sure. had been going through that treatment and that communicating that to her family and particularly to her young children. Yes. Was a process. Um, and. I, for one, am glad I didn't act a fool in public a little even more about the rumors of this. Because oh, the speculation. This, this yeah. is a real person going through a real thing. Sure. Now, sure. did I act a fool a little bit? Did I get wrapped up in this? In, in the double? In this international yeah. story a bit? Yeah. Not that I, I actually thought, as I said, every time we update, I think the, the easiest explanation is that she is sick and they needed a right. long runway for her to get right. better. And that was what made her feel comfortable. And I want to see her reemerge at Easter. I didn't want to hear this sad news. No, no. And everybody is, you know, coming to get, which is, you know, the thing that everybody comes together and say, you know, look, you know, let's put everything else aside here. And we, 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 we wish her, we wish her our best. And, and, and Harry and Meghan, Prince Harry and Meghan yeah. Markle, they said, you know, let's just put things aside. And we, you know, we wish her her best. They were the most brutal and the most vicious in, I mean, you know, his book Spare, you know? I mean, I mean, that's all they do is talk about how terrible she is and her and his brother. So please, as, uh, as, as Pierce Morgan says, spare me. But this is, you know, we, there's so much that we don't know, the nature of the cancer, right. where exactly it was found. And, and, and so, I mean, it's early enough, they say, which is good. And I assume it's chemo. It's not radiation. And right. for anybody that has to go through this or you have family members who go through this, the, 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 the thing is it's you take it at one, as one step at a time. You, you try to compartmentalize, at least this is my opinion, and you try not to think 10 steps ahead because yeah. you'll go crazy. Just look, what is in our control and what can we do now yeah. about that? And let's do it. And so that's where they are and wish them best. Wish her best. Yeah, I would, I would certainly wish her the best yeah. and that everything, the treatment is as yeah. successful as possible. Yeah. And I do think that the the palace's leaving of this information vacuum, which is not to absolve anybody who was super nasty. Oh, right. About it. That some was people, some people re were really nasty about it. But there was a vacuum that on a PR front, just aside from her health and that that part of the story. I think we'll be studied for a long time. About uh, yeah. Not uh, I do want to say of all people, you know, Joe Biden did say officially his official statement said that he is praying for them. Okay. And, and, and I can believe that Justin Trudeau he said thoughts. Okay. Thoughts. So he thoughts, but does it, does it, does it make you feel better that he's thinking of you? I don't know. He's no, like, no. you know, I, it's a thank, secular, thank secular goodness, man. That, I know. Uh, that thank goodness you you're, know. I'm in your mind. Okay. Really quickly. And then last, oh my gosh, we have okay. to do a little yeah. Christine Blasey Ford, as you'll remember, was the accuser mm -hmm. of one Brett Kavanaugh, but could not remember in her story or stay consistent about the location or date or other guests yeah. at the party in question at which she alleged an assault of some kind, as I said at the time, and I think I have a clip of myself saying this, and I'd like to play it just so that we can remember uh, what I was saying on CNN contemporaneously. I have embraced in various ways along the way, but is this shift to the standard for Supreme Court justice is to prove that he was not at a party of unknown location, unknown date, and questionable guest list 35 years ago. It is a standard to which none of us should be held. None of us could meet. Um, 
And I think it will endanger many good what is people that, what in the is future. What is the standard that you're talking about? Just the, the party? Like thing? proving a negative proving from a negative 35 about, years ago and then having your uh, high school shenanigans piled on as evidence of the negative that you are unable to prove. I think is an unfair standard for Democrat, Republican, man or woman. It is not one that I am comfortable holding anyone to in public. No one should be subject to the standard that Kavanaugh was subject to. He went about as far as you could possibly go to prove a negative. Despite having yeah. not a specific date or location. Right. No specific, you know, the allegation. Yeah. Except for the fact that she remembers his laugh. Yeah. I mean, you know. there just wasn't a lot there. And honestly, the Democrats on the, the it, was, it was a political hit job. And the yeah. Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee ran with it. Oh. Frankly, I don't, I'm not sure that Ford originally had wanted this to be a public thing and then she yeah. was sort of behind the scenes cajoled into making it a public thing then she was deemed super credible despite the fact that a lot of the facts did not stay consistent right or that she didn't have very much and that his right. facts actually refuted some of hers and that by the way in the end after the fbi had done an investigation they found out that her friend who was at the party, the one person we have yes, confirmed the, who's at the party, right. who didn't want to be a part of this, but she was interviewed by the FBI. We found out after she was interviewed by the FBI that she didn't have a memory of this, that some yes. of her details refuted yeah. this, and most importantly, that Ford's lawyers tried to convince her and bully her yeah, into, into saying, saying otherwise. Yeah, to bear false witness. All but right, it's all sort of treated as if this the point of all this is by yeah. the way sorry i should i buried the lead christine blasey ford has a memoir out so. she does and apparently it's it's terrible because as you were mentioning you sent a link to a piece in unheard but even the new york yes. times's review is basically tepid yes because you know that moment has passed and they're on to something else well that uh, that's I, what this yeah. and kate cat rosenfield is a great writer and yeah. she said she said one way back which is the memoir has received only a handful of, view, of reviews none particularly positive the new york times in its dutiful assessment of the book as important and lucid does little to obscure an overall tone of disdain what little praise ford's effort has received is delivered with the forced cheerfulness of a person accepting a terrible hand knitted wool sweater in july in yeah. a color she wouldn't be caught dead wearing how thoughtful of you. I can see you worked really hard on it. <laughs> yeah, that sums it up. I would just say the worst, we, we tend to forget these things about how awful those hearings were for Brett Kavanaugh. And the one thing I remember, the the, the analysis of the high school yearbook. Okay, yep. you should see the things people wrote in my high school yearbook. All right, I'd be done for. The whole I wouldn't thing. Be, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be allowed to host a podcast. The whole thing was embarrassing. And by the way, he, he even in that embarrassment, mm -hmm. He mustered paper calendars showing oh, where he was yeah. in, in high, high school. school. In high school. In high school. And and the other thing was the worst moment was when Sheldon, for me, was when Sheldon Whitehouse, was senator from Rhode Island, the Democrat, was asking Kavanaugh about this reference to the Devil's Triangle, and then it was he was saying it it, it was a reference to the game Quarters, and Whitehouse is like, "What is that? What is Quarters?" And Kavanaugh goes, "You don't know what Quarters is a drinking game? Nope, never heard of it. Really." Again, Look, give me a break. In the end, I thought there was going to be great. I thought there was going to be great fanfare, and I'm actually yeah. gratified that there's not over yeah. this. She me was too. only greeted unskeptically and and super super kindly at the View, yeah. which is of fitting. course um, where they believe a rapist is on the bench. Yeah. So so you know. but like yeah, I, I wish there were more apologies, but right. I'm glad that there isn't fanfare. So let's close it out. Right. You got to go to a meeting. I got to go to. I, a do, Mary Catherine. Well, first of all, yes, that wraps up this episode of Getting Hammered. Remember, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at Victory and Amanis and wishing all our listeners happy Easter. I'm at MK Hammer on Twitter at MK Hammer Time on Instagram. Follow the show at Getting Hammered Podcast on Instagram or YouTube. I'm going to hopefully make it to the doctor this afternoon. Miracle of miracles. Take care. Have a great Easter. <laughs> Thanks for getting hammered responsibly. This has been a Nebulous Media Podcast. Yeah.